lockdown. We were waiting to see what would happen. The schools were in chaos. Um, we ended up doing a final meeting of the year when the kids were back in school in June. Um, and and because to us it seemed obvious that we needed to close, we needed some way to close this program. We couldn't just abandon them after these three meetings and they'd never got to say goodbye. Uh, but because of the situation, they uh, met with one classroom sitting opposite another classroom, uh, um, the whole class on one screen. And we concluded very quickly that fine, we would finish the year like that. That's all we could do. Uh, but it wasn't good enough. It wasn't going to work for a whole year to meet like that. Uh, so the first thing we learned was we need to do these encounters either with the kids at home or while they're at least on individual screens at school, because that's the only way to create, for us, the essence was to create encounter, to create a real sense of dialogue and being able to talk to each other and meet each other. Um, we realized that usually we have we have 70 kids who take part in each of these uh, uh physical meetings, um, we were, there's no way we were going to bring 70 kids for one online meeting. That was not going to create real encounter. And therefore, what we needed to do was have smaller groups. We needed to have shorter meetings. Um, we, can't do, we can't do breakout rooms with, with kids. We can't do... Hi, sorry. We can't do we can't do breakout rooms with these kids because we can't bring Jewish and Arab kids together for for encounter with no facilitation. And if you can't have the you know, so so we can't do breakout rooms. Uh, we had to create digital materials, obviously. Um, our visits to the church, to the synagogue, and to the mosque, which are a critical part of the program, now have to be virtual tours. Um, this presented us with huge uh, challenges. Um, so we're doing it online. Some of the things that we have learned uh, and that are fascinating to me are that we have these smaller groups. And because the kids are no longer meeting in each other's schools, because they don't go visit each other's schools, in many ways, the virtual space is actually more neutral space. It's actually more equal space. Uh, and in that way, in some ways, it's much safer space. It's actually, uh, uh, um, we get much better co-facilitation by the Jewish and the Arab teachers than we, than we do in school. Uh, because when, we, when, we, when it's in school, one of them is always the host uh, uh, and, and the other is the guest and that, affects the power the power uh, balance between the teachers whereas if on, in the virtual space they can both co-facilitate in a much more equal way having said that we i don't believe that we have uh, overcome uh, all the challenges because religion and and the experience of visiting a church for example for a jewish child is not the same as watching a video of a tour of a church online because, and that's partly for, for reasons of religious law and practice as they understand it. Uh, there are some children who uh, we have to work hard with them to persuade them to enter a church in the first place, uh, to overcome their suspicion and their fear enough to enter a church. Watching a church online is not the same experience. So that embodied aspect of meeting is not something that we have uh, uh, found a way to entirely uh, overcome. We do get uh, the schools to send each other physical items connected to the religions, so that they, so that the kids get to not only see uh, religious ritual items, but they actually get to touch them as well, even if it's not whilst they're with the other. Um, but there are definitely challenges that we have yet to overcome and I, I'm looking forward to the conversation and hoping that some of your uh, experiences can help us overcome our challenges. Thank you. Thank Marianne. you so much, Sarah. 
Yes, uh, and I see that there are questions that are coming in the chat. We'll address the questions after the presentation in our discussion time. So thank you for those. Marianne? All right, one of the reasons why Sarah and I felt it would be interesting to do this is because our programs, though they're both interfaith programs, they're also very different. Uh, Sarah is working with children mainly and teachers um, presenting different challenges. Um, I will be talking about Emuna. Um, the Interfaith Leadership Program that I run um, running in uh, Amsterdam in the Netherlands. So Imuna is an Interfaith Leadership Program mainly for professionals. So it's not for students, it's not for youngsters specifically, but it's for professionals, spiritual caregivers, teachers, school principals. We try to really have the whole realm of, of the Netherlands, professionally speaking. Um, and it's all people coming from uh, coming to uh, this program with different faith backgrounds. So Jewish, Hindu, Buddhist, uh, Christian, Muslim, uh, Baha'i, and also people of non-faith or spiritual but not religious or humanist and secular and so on and so forth. So again, it's an interprofessional, intergenerational also, which is really important. We try to mix it up for young people or younger people uh, in a professional uh, setting, nevertheless. Um, I don't like the term, but middle-aged people and people who are um, working towards their uh, retirement even, but still have so much to offer, of course, to society. And that mixture of generations is also very important. Um, similar situation, of course, as with Sarah, um, we start our program in October. So we run during the academic year. Uh, had, we had had nine meetings when in March, uh, really quickly, um, overnight, um, the country, the Netherlands went into lockdown and we were no longer able to meet. Now, importantly, Imuna as an interfaith leadership program, it works with mind, heart and body. Um, so it's there's always cognitive input, either coming from people uh, from different religious traditions or also academic input, uh, certain scholarly expertise that will be shared. There's a huge emphasis on dialogical learning, which is also interpersonal learning. Uh, you know this, it's always about uh, not this tradition says this or that tradition says this, but this is the way I see it. This is what I want to share, uh, listening, learning, cultivating dialogical skills. And then the third component, which is very important, is what we'll call the hands. So there's always uh, a creative component also to these days where people actually work together. Um, using not only their mind, but their entire body. This can be in the form of role play, but of course also site visits are extremely important. Uh, it can be creative workshops and so on and so forth. Um, Emuna is a program that strongly emphasizes that and pushes back, you could say, against a what we call a modern bias um, a modern bias or a modern interpretation of religion, according to which religion is mainly something about beliefs, is mainly about the interior life, is mainly about spirituality. We push back against that, uh, saying that religion is first and foremost something that people do, that they practice in their concrete daily lives. It involves embodied practices, it involves, involves ritual, it involves space also. Now, moving this entire program online uh, clearly presents uh, numerous uh, challenges. We decided to do this, not to wait until the lockdown was over, uh, because we felt this group that had been learning with one another for quite some time would also have support to continue. You have to imagine these are spiritual caregivers in the Netherlands. Uh, spiritual caregivers were still allowed to be with the patients, whereas others were not allowed to be with patients, for example, who had COVID. Um, we have religious leaders. They have to lead their community. We have teachers and principals in very different, difficult situations, concerned about what is going on with the teachers, concerned about what is going on with the students. So we also felt that Imuna could be a place where these different professionals could also support one another in this difficult situation. Now, how do we move? Uh, how did we move forward? Um, we changed a couple of things in our program. Some of these things that we'll, we will continue to do as we also move into a more regular space again after COVID, hopefully. The first thing that we did is um, we would 
always start with a check-in. And I know in, in other contexts, people do that on a more regular basis, but this was something we didn't necessarily always do. Uh, but now we always started with a check-in <laughs> in very small breakout groups where people could just share their concerns, share their issues, and then perhaps on a, a, a temporary basis, leave them also behind. Or if the concerns were too big, then we could address them during the day also. So that was the first thing. Secondly, something that we also did um, is we uh, offered to all of our participants the possibility of spiritual care, not offered by us. That would, of course, be a conflict of interest. But we offered this possibility via the university so that people who were faced with too many moral dilemmas um, anxiety, concerns about family members or members of their community or whatever, could also uh, meet up uh, with spiritual caregivers. We felt it was our responsibility uh, as they are on a trajectory um, focusing on spirituality to also care for their spiritual health. So we offered that possibility. Thirdly, um, normally we always meet from nine to five. I think all of you have that experience. If you Zoom from nine to five, it's like, oh, that's just horrible. Uh, so we had to move into a, uh, uh, a program of what we would call blended learning. It meant particularly that I or the other experts would um, record mini lectures, which they could listen to prior to our meeting, so that the meeting itself would focus specifically on the dialogical encounter uh, and the exchange between the participants and not just to the listening, because that can be very exhausting. Um, the time management we've learned is of the utmost importance. So we, with the core team, so it's not just me, of course, there's a team of Emuna teachers. Uh, we would meet a couple of days prior to the meeting and really make, um, how do you say that, a schedule, uh, a detailed roadmap of about what needs to happen when, who has which task when, um, detailed to the minute. And you can you may think this is exaggerated, but it is not because you want to give your participants in your meeting the sense that technology is not an issue, that they forget as much as possible that they are meeting in a virtual space and that technology is working for them rather than against them. So that's that's certainly something we did to so have this very detailed um, uh, roadmap. As Sarah mentioned, when we work in groups, we make them smaller. Normally, we would have conversations with even eight people. No, four people max, yeah, so that they really could listen to one another and so on and so forth. Um, finally, um, what we a couple of words perhaps on what we lost. Perhaps that's also interesting for you to hear. I think um, one of the things that we 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 lost um, is um, the sense of embodied learning. So I started out with that um, one of the important things with dialogical learning is not just interpersonal learning, but interpersonal learning also via the body. Eh? Religion is not so, simply something you believe, but also something that you do. And you do not just learn via your mind, uh, but also via your body. And that is something uh, we have not yet found a perfect solution for that. I think importantly, however, is that, um, um, that you mention it. So that you keep mentioning that what you are not able to do virtually, rather than covering it up. Um, rather than, than ignoring it, that you at least keep mentioning what you are not able to do so that you are not uh, in an interfaith space, somehow reinforcing again that, that modern understanding of religion, that religion happens mainly via language or via words or via the mind. So by mentioning that you're losing out something uh, of that embodied uh, encounter, at least it's still somehow present. What we have done to um, bring in 
uh, something of that embodied uh, learning is by using the space and in a similar though different way as Sarah has pointed out, uh, using the space in which you are meeting one another. And uh, the space I'm, I'm talking about here is not so much a virtual space, but the private space. As you can see behind me, there's a cross and there's also a statue of Mary. So we have learned um, uh, to make use of the private space in our encounter um, as, as an, an element of interfaith learning. Many people think uh, religion happens mainly in sacred buildings. The nice thing about um, meeting virtually here is that um, you can also showcase that religion is also happening in the daily uh, atmosphere of the personal life. Um, and that is something that you by all likelihood do not have when you meet uh, in a synagogue or in the academy or and so on and so forth. But it is an opportunity when we meet virtually to bring in the messiness of daily life as a space where religion also happens. So that's what I wanted to share. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mariana. I'm not sure exactly what happened to the screen here okay. um, in terms of how it changed. Yes, what about um, so yeah. uh, if you have your mics on, please turn them off. Uh, I, I think there's been a lot of feedback and I can't right now see whose mic is on. But somebody's mic is on giving um, some feedback here. Uh, so thank you so much for those presentations. Um, we, I think it went a little bit over, so uh, looks like our time is a little bit more limited for our discussion, but I was wondering if we just open it up with our general question about, um, you know, how do these cases resonate with your work? Um, and and we'll go in then to some, some of your reflections about the design process. Um, I see there's also some questions on the, in the chat. Uh, and you're welcome to uh, raise those as well. But let me just open it up first uh, for general conversation about what resonated. Should we all do what uh, Sarah said and turn on all our mics so we're in the same space <laughs> to get the conversation going? <laughs> Yes, I, I would be happy to, uh, I just want to resonate a couple of things back to Marianne, because uh, there are a few things that she mentioned that, that uh, uh, I, I have also very much found. The, what, the particular is the, the planning every minute yeah. uh, um, uh, uh, of the sessions, because it, one just has to have a very, very, very detailed breakdown of how it's going to work and, and who's doing what. Um, the other thing I would say that we have, uh, that I realize we have done is I, early on, I said to my team, you've got to stop thinking of this as the poor alternative to meeting in person. This is a different space. Let's relate to it as the space it is and not try and just, you know, do what we would do if we were meeting in person. Let's, let's use all the things that we can from the, from the virtual space that we have and take advantage of the advantages it has as well as the, uh, uh, as well as the challenges. So I, also, I think that has also been, uh, been key. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, Jelena, I think, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing your name right, but I think you also had something you wanted to say. Yes, Helena or uh, Elena. Helena, yes. <laughs> Um, thank you very much for having me in this uh, this room, and thank you for a wonderful presentation. Uh, greetings from Nairobi. Um, I'm ethnic uh, Serbian woman in her mid forties, and actually I work on Somalia, South Sudan, Ethiopia, and I'm dealing primarily with. Um, actually, I moved from those from 10, 20 to forty years of age, prime age workers with ILO, uh, to work with. Um, students uh, and offer in a way alternative uh, basic education and lately accelerated when I've listened to to Sarah um, uh, in particular um, I had one question which is which is related to uh, okay protection issues um, definitely embedded in the, the approach that Sarah you you and your group uh, your team is doing 
Um, and in my, in my, I would say, view, uh, the, the, the internet is safe, uh, however, has limitations. Uh, but my question to you was what to do when you have internet available, however, you don't have classrooms uh, built up uh, because they were, they are, they are on the move if the community is moving, so you cannot count on that. Question for you and a question for uh, Marian, uh, Marian uh, I'm sorry, now I'm excusing myself, um, is actually uh, how do we measure the impact of adapted project? Because you are speaking about the mature, matured participant, someone who um, um, is able to seek help, right? Someone who recognizes that he or she is not doing well uh, and will go to your blended program, will go to the recorded session. What to do when you have people uh, that are um, still like in between if they are going to participate on the project and they're crucial for the participation of your project, not just because of the numbers and to get the funding, no, because of the good health and well-being of the community you work or belong to. Thank you. Um, I, so in, in, in answer to your question about a, a hybrid approach, um, I, I, we, we are asking ourselves at the moment uh, um, whether if, you know, if, if and when we get back to what we used to regard as normal, will we just go back to physical space? Or will we try and actually use some of the advantages of, of, of what we found uh, in the digital space and particularly this, this business of it being much more neutral and in a way equal space? Of course, that's dependent on everybody having access to the internet, uh, um, which is not a given. Um, but but you know, and and there's a difficulty also with the hybrid work because I think Marianne uh, in 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 the plenary mentioned the um, you know we talk about creating a contract with the group. The group have to create a contract as to what their rules what their rules are going to be as to how they work. The contract in the online space is different from the contract in the physical space. Uh, and therefore, moving back and to between the two, particularly, I think, with children, is, is confusing. Um, so we haven't, we haven't yet crossed that bridge. <laughs> uh, and I guess we'll cross the bridge when we come to it. We are hoping that, you know, possibly at the very end of the school year uh, or, or even at the beginning of the next, can we bring these children who've only met each other online? Could we at least once get them to meet in uh, in, in real life? Um, we will have to wait and see. Okay, Yelena, I'm not sure if I if I got your question uh, completely right. Um, so, are you asking me? Are you telling me that my group of of participants are already mature? They are already adults, so they have a good sense of their needs also and their responsibilities in the program, as compared to younger students. Is that the direction? That was my direction. Yes. Okay. Because, because, uh, because uh, we have always the like uh, foster cares, uh, like parents, like uh, um, adults who shadow, in a way, uh, younger uh, students or participants of pro projects, like because we cannot call them students. So uh, if they are not shadowed and reminded sometimes to participate in something that is recorded, that it's not coming in the standard time, um, how, did you, how did you overcome that, that barrier, if you had it at all? Mm, that's yeah. what I would Thank you. Yeah, so it's it's uh, of course I don't work with 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 part, with children, so that's a, a, a completely different situation. Uh, but what I've learned um, now, switching again to my work as a as a university teacher, some of the students are eighteen, um, just barely starting, uh, and um, I've I've learned to, uh, and I'm sure you, that's the kind of work that you also are doing. A couple of things: first, the recorded lectures. Um, they have precisely an advantage um, for those students who sometimes miss out because they stay recorded. 
so I've got the feedback from my students that precisely the fact that I recorded the lectures and I left them open for weeks and weeks allowed them to reconnect and to go back, even if their internet was at a certain moment in unstable or they were busy with other things or their mind was occupied or and so on and so forth. So the recording actually allowed them to um, um, learn in some ways eh, better than if we would have done this synchronously at a set st um, pace which didn't always work for them yeah does that make sense so that's the first thing so i think i'm going to keep that anyway even if i'm going to start teaching again i'm going to keep also the recorded lecture. secondly i've learned as a as a teacher um, to be really proactive, does that make sense? So I have about 15 students that really belong to me. I coordinate them. And I feel hugely responsible for them because I also have children and I see what this pandemic is doing to them. They, they get disconnected. Sometimes they get a little bit anxious. They miss their friends and so on and so forth. And I've learned to be really proactive. So one of the things that I've said is I'm going to open my Zoom every Wednesday between five and seven. And just give me a, a notch uh, if you need some time and whatever it is. Um, I'll, sometimes it's about helping them with scheduling their, their, their studies. Sometimes it's because they're getting anxious because it's so much for them. Uh, sometimes it's just something else. And if I can help them as a teacher, I'll help them as a teacher if it's something that we need more professional help, then I'm on to it immediately and then I will uh, send them along. And I know the situation in which I work is really different from where you are working, but to be there not when there's a problem, but proactively be before there's a problem has really helped, I think. Thank you, Mariana. Can I just, that reminds me that another thing that we have taken to doing is just as the facilitators will stay in a physical room until the group is after the group has formally finished and until everybody else leaves we will leave the zoom and the facilitators will stay in the virtual place for as long as anybody else is there our facilitators will be there precisely for that after <laughs> the informal stuff at the end of the meeting um so it's in a way a similar thing to what you're you're saying of course it's it's more public, it's more open, but Marianne, as you say, that, that you need you need to feel people as they uh, as as they are in the moment. That Thank seems you so much for this. There seems to be a question from Edwidge. I don't know whether I'm saying this correctly about empathic listening and how that how you you learn this um, at the in a context of of, of uh, Zoom. Um, I think it's a very important question. I just wanted to quickly touch upon it. I, I think perhaps it's also your experience that um, one of the downsides, there's many good things, but one of the downsides of working via Zoom or another platform, of course, is that one, you're still at home, so you might be distracted by everything that is also going on in your house. I sometimes am, I have four children walking around here. Uh, sometimes tend to just walk in when they are not supposed to. And secondly, uh, you're uh, in front of your screen and so mails might come in or you might think, oh, why don't I just read the newspaper or you'll be distracted by something. And so um, really cultivating empathic listening and your listening attitudes becomes even more important perhaps or it has reminded me at least of how important it is to really cultivate an, a, a, an attitude of empathic listening. And one of the exercises that we did um, this year was an exercise in non-listening. And what does it do with you as the non-listener and what does it do to the other who is not listened to? So it was one of the first exercises we did with the group. So someone had to relate a story something they, they they did during the week enthusiastically yeah and the other person needed to not listen actively not listen it's really difficult yeah to actively not listen and then exchange about what did this do with you and so 
from time to time now in our group, we will refer back to that exercise and it has really helped people to be much more conscious in the space and be more aware of that people notice it when you are doing something else uh, and pretending to listen while you're actually uh, uh, reading the newspaper. But it has also helped our group to also when we do not meet virtually, but in person to mention, I'm sorry, uh, I'm distracted. I'm not able to listen to you at this moment. It has nothing to do with you, but um, we've been going on too long. I need a break or I need to just get up for a moment or and so on and so forth. And it has really helped to go. Just pointing that out. Thank you for that. Um, we just have a few minutes. And in these last minutes, I was hoping to open up the conversation for to all of the participants to share uh, you know, some of their own ideas and some of the challenges that they faced. Um, so there's two. One is, um, uh, what can you do to build trust? What are some of the challenges and, and how have you been able to overcome some of those challenges? If we could just open it up for the, to the whole group. We heard some really great examples from Sarah and Marianne, but we also want to hear from you as participants and from your experience in terms of how you've been able to overcome some of these challenges. Yes, Kate. One of the techniques that I've been using and that I learned through Zoom is to turn off your self view. Um, and I have gotten a lot of feedback. So like right now, or during this time, I've, I've been able to see myself um, in a window because I don't know how to turn it off here because I haven't bothered to learn. Um, but when people get exhausted trying to also emotionally worry about what they look like to other people and seeing it and i've gotten a lot of good feedback that when people turn off their own view that that reduces the fatigue and the emotional um, energy that goes into maintaining that thank you that's a really good point um it's a really good point are there others Yeah, I'll say something. Hi. Yes, please, Annika. North Wales. So, a couple of things. Um, it, this was very helpful for working with um, kids, my clients right now. I'm a therapist, and just some of the things that they're experiencing in their online classroom, you know, teenagers, if they were to, I can talk to the principal actually, you know, and say, you know, are some of the, for some of the kids, if they had, like, like you were saying, Marianne, just a little online lecture, and then maybe you can do a group with a, with a friend so that they can start to have a different experience, which isn't just about uh, this rigid kind of uh, also, um, it's kind of like the monitoring, like the Zoom becomes, are you there? Are you present? Are you showing up? Rather than this is my daily learning now. This is how I'm doing my learning. This is how I'm connecting. So that was very helpful for this brainstorming that I'm doing with my clients, how we can kind of get the message, give some feedback right away to the schools and say, hey, this is actually what the mature, independent student needs that, that you know. So to kind of get through some of those barriers and problem solve together, that was really helpful. And, um, and the ecotherapy piece is, is uh, really just about the indoor and the outdoor space and how we bringing back our experiences in the outdoor space. You know, so if I'm having a, a, I was thinking about reflection, like for me, I go out and I walk and I can do a, a reflection outside and then bring it back or take photos outside so I can bring some of that sacred embodied space of my life. But I know that there's gonna be a place where I can reconnect it. So I might be having kind of a pilgrimage or a or a journey through nature or a spiritual experience, but then I have a way that I'm reflecting and bringing that back, so that um, this this becomes a space of interaction and sharing, not a replacement for my for my embodied time in a way. You know, like even going and doing a dance and recording myself dancing on the on the on the sand you know as a kind of like and then sharing that or just my photographs in nature and sort of so just this idea that we, we're under pressure now to spend so much more time indoors but our rejuvenation is outdoors and so 
thinking different differently conceptually about how we're now sharing our indoor and outdoor spaces privately and publicly and connecting that so thank you thank you Aniko that's uh, really wonderful um, ideas that you shared there about the embodied outdoor space and being able to share that um, in the last few minutes that we have left are there others that mm -hmm. would like to share here I have, yes, Kate? I have one more idea, but I've already shared one, so I don't want to take, but in case nobody else has anything. I, um, I don't know if I'm pronouncing your name right. Ijeoma, are you, uh, were you nodding your head that you wanted to speak? Yes? Um, I can't quite see your face. Let's see. Did you have something you wanted to add, Ijeoma? Yes, please. Mm -hmm. Respond to the issues of sexual and gender based violence, women and children in general. You know, because they, they, the other child is what they don't have. So they don't have women sitting on the We're having trouble hearing you. Respond to the issue of the Ijeoma, we're having trouble hearing you. Can you uh, maybe put the camera down a little bit so that we can see your face more and that way perhaps we'll be able to hear your voice better. The camera will pick up your voice better. Just tilt it down so. No, we're still having trouble hearing. Hmm. Okay, um, Kate, can I turn to you? Sure, but if you, if you are able to come back, please just jump in. Um, one of the things that, well, I teach in an asynchronous mode. Um, and so one of the things I had my students do was to film a, an introductory bio. And one of the advantages of them being home was I asked them to bring a special item um, or something that they could explain. Uh, and so it was nice, some people had their dogs because I had some military vets who have service, um, emotional support dogs, um, but they were able to bring something tangible um, that they could describe that they might not have been able, to, that they would not have been able to do or wanted to do in a classroom. Um, but I will say just overall, I wonder how much of the concerns we have are A, due to the fact that we're in COVID, I'm in the United States and we're still so messed up. I mean, I've been under lockdown since March. Not everybody is, which is part of the problem, <laughs> um, but there's all that added anxiety. And so as someone who's been online for years, I just wanna make sure that people remember that it's not just the online environment. There's so much um, extra stress out there and we're still building the skills. Um, one of the resources that I can share and if I can remember where to find it is using sign language um, online. So that there's ways like you can, you know, I like this, so you're getting more feedback and it's also ways that facilitators can talk to each other. Um, like we're used to doing in classroom or, you know, in, in spaces so that we're not having to talk. And so anyway, those were my extra thoughts. That's really uh, great. It's helpful. And maybe since I don't have the ability to do sign language here, I'm wondering, Juan, how much time we have left for the breakout? <laughs> so uh, we, we've been sending messages, but obviously they don't arrive. I think you have about a minute left. <laughs> Okay, just wanting to check. I, I knew we were short on time, but I wasn't exactly sure how much. He's Thank about you. to bring you back in literally like one minute. We sent out several several messages, but then none of them arrived. I love the platform. It's great. <laughs> Thanks, Juan. Thanks. I appreciate that. Great. So in this last minute, um, I was wondering if others, uh, Edwig, I see that you, it looks like uh, you wanted to say something. Happy to turn to you. Yeah. Sorry, my connection is not so good, but I just wanted to share something I experienced uh, in a group yesterday. 
to connect uh, all uh, all of us all each all of us uh, it was to get a piece of food uh, like and when we were talking uh, just showing it i feel it's con it was connected with us and i really like it and i already experienced it in a in a normal group in a in person group like we had to pick a piece of the nature and come back and 